The opposite of fear is bravery. Hmm. Nope. The opposite of fear is curiosity. Is the glass half empty? Is it half full? That misses the point. Elevating curiosity will help you see and understand what's in the glass. This is Applied Curiosity Lab Radio, the podcast of curiosity. In each episode, Becky Saltzman interviews unconventional thinkers and doers in her unconventional way to dissect and uncover what you can use to see things others miss, make better decisions, and apply your talents in new and profound ways. Elevate curiosity, escape the boundaries of ordinary. But with these executive orders, the president is technically, in my view, making laws just like Congress. So there could be an argument that, listen, this is beyond the power of the president under the Constitution. The problem with it is that historically it's been done, you know, there's been, I think, 13,000 of these since the dawning of the American Republic. Hello, curiosity seekers and adventurous thinkers. Welcome to episode four of Applied Curiosity Lab Radio. I am your host, Becky Saltzman. And in this episode, we are going to hear from a constitution demystifier. What's that? Brilliant question. A constitution demystifier is exactly who I was seeking as I was trying to make sense of something I probably should have been far more curious about before. And that is the distinction between what is unconstitutional, what is illegal, and what is simply just unconventional. And when I heard about things that Donald Trump was doing, for example, can he benefit from foreign officials and dignitaries staying at his hotels? Or can he use RNC funds to pay his legal fees from the Russian probe? I was trying to think, do I even understand if this is okay? And if it's not okay, how is it not okay? And why have I never thought of these things before? So I called my friend Kirsten Williams in Washington, D.C., and she introduced me to a constitution demystifier and brilliant constitutional scholar named Kimberly Whaley. Kimberly Whaley is a professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law. She's the former assistant U.S. attorney and associate independent counsel in the Whitewater investigation. She's a go-to expert for the media on issues about debunking the Constitution. She has consulted to the FBI on privacy and Fourth Amendment issues, participated in the review of nomination of Judge Merrick Garland for the U.S. Supreme Court. She's an expert in federal administrative law, federal procedure and jurisdiction, constitutional law, privacy and cybersecurity. And I think you're going to be very interested in what she has to say about that and how that affects you personally. And she is the author of the forthcoming book, The Outsourced Constitution, How Public Power in Private Hands Erodes Democracy. So my conversation with Kim is fascinating. We had a little bit of a technical audio difficulty, so I hope you can hear past that, because if you do, I think you're going to find a lot that could be very important for you to know. For example, where does the government begin and end? How does the Constitution work and not work in ways that will probably surprise you? What are the downsides or hidden downsides to smaller government? And what happens to your rights when the government hands over government function to the private sector? Specifically, what happens to your constitutional rights? What does privacy mean today and how private are your personal effects? We talk about the difference between policy and politics. We talk about how to figure out whether something's bias or fake news. And we talk about a tolerance for the gray area and how law is kind of the quintessential gray area. And we touch on the Supreme Court and how to understand the distinctions and debunk some of the myths around what it means to be a liberal judge or an originalist. So we get into the weeds, but she's very much able to take esoteric and complicated topics and make them very digestible. And I employ lots of curious questions to help along the way. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Professor Whaley as much as I did. And without further ado, here's Kim. Hey, Kim, welcome to the show. Hi, Becky. So happy to be here. I am so happy. You and I met when I asked a mutual friend of ours I said I was coming to D.C. for the Women's March, and I really wanted to meet a constitutional law expert because I was seeing all this stuff on Facebook and on social media, 
is this legal? Is this constitutional? How can people do this? Is this okay? Is that okay? And I thought, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure that I understand the differences and the distinctions. So I called my our mutual friend Kirsten. And I said, hey, when I'm in DC, do you have anyone that you know who's an expert? She says, oh my God, I have the perfect person. She's a professor of constitutional law. She's a perfect person. So I was so excited and I've been really happy that we've stayed in touch. And now I can actually say I have my own friend who's a constitutional law expert. Well, it's so. been a pleasure getting to know you and I'm just so happy to be part of this effort. Fantastic. You and I talked a lot as I was gearing up to launch Apply Curiosity Lab Radio, and you've been sprinting toward the handoff of your book to Cambridge University Press. As you know, on this show, there is no agenda more sacred than curiosity. So we don't shy away from topics that I think we're normally taught not to talk about at cocktail parties. We don't shy away from sex or drugs, race, religion, nor do we shy away from politics. So I think we can take off our kit gloves and have a very candid conversation about the Constitution. The uh, careers that we choose, I think, are often a result of a very specific moment or a few tangible deciding factors or a spark ignited by a lecture or conversation. And I'm wondering, how did you decide to become a constitutional lawyer? I think for me, it was when I was at the Department of Justice in what is known as the United States Attorney's Office. Each district has a U.S. attorney that handles civil and criminal cases for the federal government. I was on the civil side. And we ended up defending the U.S. government and all kinds of lawsuits, including, for example, people that wanted to protest in front of the White House. And is that a First Amendment question or not? And and how do we go about representing the United States? And what are people's interests in that regard? So that was really exciting. And I loved the pace of the litigation and the intellectual rigor of it. And then when I decided to go into law teaching, which is what I do full time now, my research as well as my teaching went in that direction as well. What do you think would surprise most listeners about the Constitution and the law? Well, the Constitution, I think... What I have found in having conversations just with friends and colleagues who are not lawyers, I think it comes as a surprise to people that the Constitution only binds the government. It does not apply to regulate private parties, individuals, or companies' behavior, with the exception of the 13th Amendment's ban on slavery. So if an individual private citizen attempts to violate that, there could be a constitutional problem. But beyond that, it really only binds the government. So what has interested me for many years is where does the government begin and end? Because we see a lot in the news media coverage about big corporate America, influence in politics, what's really happening behind the scenes, who's speaking to our leaders. And what I've found in researching this question is when government functions are performed by private parties, the Constitution stops. The Constitution doesn't govern that behavior. All right. So when someone says to me, you are infringing on my constitutional rights, I can't, as a private citizen, technically infringe on someone's constitutional rights outside of the 13th Amendment. I mean, that's not possible because it doesn't bind me. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that is what I'm saying. I mean, there there are tricky doctrines. When I say doctrines, it means rules that are developed under the Constitution for attaching constitutional limits to private parties. But the, the threshold's very, very high. Essentially, the government has to be completely controlling, almost completely controlling a private party to have the Constitution apply to a private party. So for the most part, there's a strict divide from a constitutional law standpoint between the public and the private sector, where as a practical matter, there is no longer that kind of a divide in terms of how our government operates. So if a corporation does something that if a government did, or if the government did, would infringe upon my constitutional rights, and maybe you can give an example probably better than I, If a company did that, they're not infringing on my constitutional rights because with technical exceptions, they can't. 
That's correct. I mean, there might be other sources of law that limit how a company can operate, and there are. So there can be what what we know as statutes, which legislatures pass, or what's known as common law, which is decisions by prior courts. But constitutionally, no. So for example, if you're at your workplace and you speak in a meeting in a way that your boss doesn't like, you don't have a First Amendment claim if if your boss somehow retaliates against your speech. Depending on the content, there might be some other statutory claim. I don't know, considering this hypothetical, but there's no constitutional claim. Another example might be if you are a university student and you're kicked out of your university for cheating. If the university happens to be a state university, then you would have a potential due process right. You could say, listen, you can't throw me out of school unless I get notice and an opportunity to be heard, some kind of a hearing. If you happen to be at a private college, you don't have that right. You can't claim that they should have followed certain procedures before they decided to kick you out of school. So it can be really different in terms of whether there's a constitutional claim or not. Another example might be when you're going through security at an airport, some airports have federal government agents that work for the TSA that actually screen you when you go through the security line. And in that instance, if there's some kind of violation to your personal privacy, you would have or potentially could have a constitutional claim for money against the TSA and that individual worker claiming, listen, you violated my constitutional rights. If the TSA happened to have contracted to a private company, the security in that particular airport, which I think when I last counted, there were 17 in the United States airports in that range that had private contractors working for the TSA and the same behavior took place. So say they're they're snooping on your personal items or maybe even through one of those x-ray machines, they're looking at something that is very private to you and sharing it with their friend, for example, there would be no constitutional claim if the security officer happened to be contracted out to a private company. Wow. Now, aren't there a lot of organizations that are quasi-government, meaning In the example of the TSA, there may be some TSA agents that are government agents and some TSA agents that are private agents. At what point is it a government entity versus a private entity when it's mushed like that? Well, that's an excellent question. I think it gets to who's paying your paycheck, essentially. If you're employed by Security Agency Inc. and TSA hires Security Agency Inc., to do the security for the San Francisco airport, then you are a private person. You're a private party, private employee. You're not technically working for TSA. If you are hired by TSA, you pass whatever background checks are required to work for the federal government. Federal government pays your paycheck. You're in their pension systems and their health insurance systems, all those things. Oftentimes, you'll take an oath, depending on what your particular position is, an oath of, of loyalty to the Constitution or to you know the federal law. That means you're a federal employee. And if you violate someone's constitutional rights, you could be personally liable out of your pocket for money damages to that person. That's not the case if the person who screens you happens to be working for Security Company, Inc. And as a member of the public, you don't know, of course, going through security, whether it's a government agent or not. Is there a way that an individual citizen can identify whether they are needing to sue for their constitutional rights being violated or whether they're just needing to sue on the law? Is there a way to know that? There are two questions there. One is, if you actually had a something happen to you, you were injured, who do you sue? And there are ways of finding out, you know, who the security people were and who they were employed by. To me, the to me the more interesting quagmire is, as a citizen, that the arbitrariness 
of that choice, the fact that as a as an individual going through security, I don't have any way of knowing in advance unless I actually got online and identified who does security for that particular airport, whether it's the government or not. And why does that matter? Well, that's a whole other discussion, but presumably to the extent to which the Constitution is going to protect me, maybe I want to know that. We hear a lot about privatization and we hear a lot about outsourcing. Is that an actual tactic that the government can use to skirt the Constitution? Well, I don't know if it's a deliberate tactic. I think most government servants are there for the right reasons, or many of them. But the odd irony of it is the less oversight a government agency has over a contractor, a private contractor, the less likely there is to be constitutional scrutiny of what that private party is doing on behalf of the government. So the more hands off the government is, the less likely there is to be a constitutional claim. The more the government keeps control over that private party, the more likely there is to be a constitutional claim. So I think cynically, there certainly is an incentive to just pass the hot potato and say, listen, that's a private contractor. That's not my problem. And I think that there are examples of that happening. And, you know, the other thing to answer your question is when you're talking about budgets and big government, and we hear a lot about get government off my back, government's too big, we have too much regulation, government's interfering with the market. You know, this is a pitched political battle between what some might call progressives, liberals on the one hand, who believe government should have a bigger role, and conservatives on the other, who believe government should be shrunk. The irony of it is government, at least the federal level, number of employees hasn't really changed in 20 years, but the number of private contractors has skyrocketed. It's fluctuated, to be sure, but the point being, certainly in terms of adhering to that platform, there's an incentive for our lawmakers, when I say lawmakers, members of Congress, and even the president, to use a lot of private parties to conduct the government's business if they want to stand on the stump and say, listen, we're shrinking government, we've kept government small. Because so once that's handed off, that doesn't count towards a federal entity. And, you know, there are real issues with keeping track of what these people are doing in a way that's consistent with our constitutional values. I wonder, that seems like such an unintended consequence of shrinking the government by handing it off to private citizens. I wonder how, I mean, I know that I did not realize it's a way of saying, okay, once a private citizen is doing the function of a government, the the constitutionality of what the private citizen is doing versus the government doing it changes dramatically. One area in which the use of the private sector to perform traditional government functions is particularly sensitive is in the area of law enforcement and surveillance. And this is not something that most people associate with outsourcing or privatization. But with the expansion of the internet and technological innovation has come the ability to to mine big data for information. And the government obtains a lot of that data from the private sector. And if the private sector gathers it, the Fourth Amendment, which is traditionally bans or technically bans the government from searching your personal effects, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to the private sector. So if we go back in time, you know, to the 80s, for example, government might put a law enforcement officer in a car to follow you around and park outside your place of business, park outside a bar that you might visit after work, determine who you're meeting by actually visually observing or getting a court-ordered wiretap, perhaps, to record your conversations. Today, government can purchase your public clicking and data digital footprint from private parties. As I'm sitting here, right to the left of me is Alexa. And she's plugged in. And 
supposedly she's not listening to anything I'm saying in my office unless I say, I shouldn't have said Alexa, I'm sure she just turned on. Now, I don't know when I signed up for Alexa and I checked the bar, you know, check the box, agree to these terms. I have this idea that Amazon promised that Alexa's not listening, but I have no idea if Amazon in its fine print said somewhere, if the government does X, Y, and Z, we're going to share Alexa's results with, with you. I mean, I didn't probably read the fine print. I just clicked agree. And, you know, the other day I had a friend that used to work at Amazon come over and he said, you know, they say that Alexa doesn't turn on until you say Alexa, but they're trying to kind of make it better. And in making it better, they're trying to see, do you have aggravation before you demand Alexa? So there's a lot of leading up to listening to you. So now I'm thinking, okay, I've invited Alexa into my home to listen to every conversation and it wouldn't be infringing on my constitutional right to have Amazon share that with the government and then the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply because the government didn't get it from me. They bought it from a source that I said could have it. That's exactly right. And even if you did did not click, even if you walk outside and go to your bank and take money out, for example, you'll have a video camera, closed circuit TV camera, taking a video of your activity. That's made public as well, meaning it's effectively a waiver. So if you walk around on the street and you're making your face visible and it's picked up by people looking at you visually or cameras recording you, you've essentially under the law, as a matter of the Fourth Amendment law said, I'm waiving essentially my Fourth Amendment rights. And so the Fourth Amendment, the law was developed under it prior to the technological age, and it really is not sensitive to what privacy means today. And frankly, I think many people aren't sensitive to those distinctions either. I mean, I've been really struck by the news recently about President Trump's commission to investigate election fraud and the public outrage at the idea that states would be forced to turn over information to the federal government on felony convictions, elections they voted in, the last four digits of their social, for example. And all of that information and even more is available to government already. And I've had this conversation with people ad hoc recently, and they'll say, well, I have a real problem with government seeking that directly from states but I don't have a problem with it going into Google's hands, for example. And I don't know if that's something that we just as a society need to connect those dots or whether we need to get to the point where we're feeling the impacts of this level of surveillance, but it's already happened. So I, I've just been really somewhat amazed by the public outcry it just demonstrates people really do want privacy and we're not getting it. It's almost fatigue. We cannot access the things we want to access without agreeing to give up our privacy. What you're saying is we don't connect the dots that by giving up our privacy to these private companies, it's just a hop, skip and a jump to giving up our privacy to the government. And I guess my question is why should we be concerned? In other words, the reason for the Fourth Amendment is clear. I think people have privacy fatigue. They think, well, you know what, it's a fait accompli. They're gonna know what they're gonna know. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not a terrorist. Why should I care? Why should people care? Yeah, I, there's a lot of thinking and research around that topic. I would just say, as a matter of human nature, Behavior changes when you think you're being watched all the time. There's certainly a loss of autonomy, a loss of a sense of self. There are psychological effects to that. It can affect your ability to, or your sense that you can speak freely, that you can um, meet with who you want to meet with and have ideas that might not be popular with whoever is in power. Just practical things like 
your ability to get insurance. Yeah, so it has it has tremendous practical implications, even in a purely private sector sense as well. Sure, I mean, if you have, you know, some kind of illness or some something you you want to hide and you don't want to make public, that would be really embarrassing. Sure, it can affect whether you're going to be hired for a particular job or whether you'd get some kind of health insurance or life insurance, et cetera. But from the government standpoint, I mean, it's problematic that you could be associated with, you know, some kind of crime or potential crime when you didn't even mean to do anything wrong. That is government takes your data and runs an algorithm on your particular data and comes up with scenarios, basically creates a story about you that may or may not be accurate. I mean, there's no way for an individual citizen to make sure that this information that's being aggregated by private parties, not only individual companies like Google or Verizon, but there are there are third party data aggregators that, that just collect all this information and sell it to the government. It could be inaccurate, and as a as a private citizen, you don't know what what's in your dossier, and there's no way of correcting it. And once you get caught up in suspicion of some kind of criminal activity, it's hard to unravel that. It's it's difficult to get in that criminal justice system and unravel it. So so there's certainly the sense that there could be errors made, but there's also And I think it's borne out by the public outrage in general with government watching you. There's also just this sort of scary sense that it's going to impede our our freedom, our liberties. And the the founders of the Constitution, the framers of the Constitution, were very, very concerned with that. Their foundational notion was that the structure of government has to be set up to ensure individual liberty. And I think privacy, even though it's not expressed in the Constitution, is something that we as a population— believe is consistent with our sense of liberty, that government snooping on our private conversations, it's as if you're, you know, whispering to your sister or your spouse, something extremely personal and government's listening to that and adding it to your file is a terrifying idea. And now I think because the data is not collected within the auspices of the constitution, the limits have to be legislative. They have to be established by Congress at the federal level, state legislatures at the state level, federal agencies with the executive branch, you know, our elected officials. And if people don't understand the nature of the problem, you know, the regular everyday people, there's not much incentive to make sure that there are non-constitutional legal mechanisms to ensure that we're protected. And as you mentioned as well, we just live in a world where, you know, we can't just all go live in a forest in a log cabin off the grid and not have any digital footprint. I mean, I heard today that the country of Sweden is considering going completely a credit card industry in terms of monetary payments, that they're not going to use cash anymore. And so every time you swipe your credit card, There's a footprint of where you've been and what you purchased, and you can track your physical whereabouts as well as what your interests are. And if you want to go to Sweden, if this continues, you literally can't buy a meal or stay in a hotel without having a digital footprint. Well, it's interesting, as you were saying, the whole notion of privacy is such a slippery slope because it's hard to know at what point is it reasonable to be concerned and at what point is it paranoia just as it's very difficult to understand what's unconstitutional what's illegal and what's just unconventional and that's one of the things you and I have talked about a couple of times is we're trying to understand government behavior and everyone's weighing in on can he do that and can they do that and isn't that constitutional unconstitutional or isn't that illegal? How do we unpack that? How do we look at those three things, constitutional, legality, and convention? The first step is constitution, as you've outlined it. And I think what I tell my law students is that is the boss of all laws in our country. And not every democratic society has a written document that sets forth our rights and 
the government's responsibilities, but we have that. So it's the boss of the bosses in terms of the law. But as I mentioned already, it only applies to the government. So they're really, and this gets to your question on privacy as well. The studies have shown, the empirical studies have shown that people do want government to have enough information to keep us safe from terrorists, but not to just snoop randomly because they want to track what's going on with us when it's none of their business. So these are very, very hard lines to draw. Um, the other thing to understand, I think, about the Constitution, in addition to realizing that it only applies to government behavior, is that there are what I call two different axes of constitutional thought. So one is uh, individual rights-based constitutional thought. So we walk around as American citizens with a bundle of rights that essentially protect us against undue government interference with our individual liberties. So most of them are contained in what's known as the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. So we have the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, Due Process Clause, and the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, the Eighth Amendment Prohibition on Cruel and Unusual Punishment. And if government as a whole or an individual actor, both at the federal, state, or local level, does something to violate an individual's constitutional rights, that person could file a lawsuit and get either an injunction making them stop and or money damages. But that's very specific to that individual. So it's like, I broke my arm, I have constitutional rights, just like I have an arm, my personal constitutional rights were broken in a very specific way to me, and I'm gonna get money. The other axis of constitutional thought is what I call the structural constitution. And this is something that has become a front burner issue with our current presidential administration in ways that I think is could be unprecedented historically. I mean, there's certainly examples of it. Watergate is the most recent one that comes to mind that we hear about. By the structural constitution, I mean, What's the blueprint for government in the Constitution that makes sure that our government is accountable, that makes sure that government doesn't cross the line and interfere with individual liberties? The framers had a sense of human nature and the idea that power corrupts and you might have the nicest king ever, but the next king might not be so nice and could be a dictator and really infringe on individual rights. So the framers of the Constitution set up our system so that we have three branches, no branch is the boss, and each branch has two other branches grading their papers. So two bosses for each branch. Nobody is, no one branch has all the power. And that was set up by design to ensure that we didn't fall into dictatorship. And what I think is happening, or at least many people are concerned about constitutional scholars and others is that in our current political climate, that structural constitutional system is being tested. So use an example. I think a lot of people throw out that as a general concern, but what specific example can you use to help us think about this? That's my first question. And my second question, if you could touch on this as you answer the question, touch on the role of motivation, because it seems to me that there needs to be a level of motivation for this whole balancing act to really work. Yeah. So to answer your first question, an example, you know, prior to this administration, no one's ever heard of the emoluments clause, which in the Constitution, it's very clear, prohibits presidents. Well, no, actually, there's a, some debate as to whether it applies to the president, but it, it yeah, prohibits the federal employees or federal officers from taking gifts from foreign governments. And I'm paraphrasing. So the, that is out there, right? It's in the Constitution, but unless one of the other two branches checks an alleged violation of that, it's meaningless. So we have some lawsuits that are wending their way through the courts on the emoluments clause. The judicial branch could check the president on that and say, okay, this is or isn't a violation, or this is a violation. Under this example, Congress could become concerned and impeach the president or take action to impeach the president, or nothing can happen. And if nothing can happen, then 
nothing happens. And the question is, how, what's the power of our constitution? It's only so powerful as, as the other branches are willing to enforce it. And this gets to motivation. So we have, as I mentioned, three branches of government, judicial branch is appointed. They cannot be fired except by impeachment and their salaries are established under the constitution and they cannot be lowered by Congress. So the idea is they're apolitical actors. They're going to make decisions based on the facts and the law, and they're not going to be persuaded by voters. The other two branches are, are voter dependent. The idea is government essentially boils down to individual voters and citizens. And if we don't like how a particular branch is acting in one of the, the elected branches, we vote them out of office. Or if we want to influence them some way, we do it at the ballot booth. So the test for that will come, you know, in four years, three and a half years, if President Trump is reelected as to whether that affect of the system is functioning to the extent to which there are alleged constitutional violations or problems with how he's been operating or Congress has been operating, we'll see in 2018, the voters have to go to office and say, listen, we want you adhering to the Constitution. Um, and if you don't, we're going to vote you out and put somebody in place who is, because that is our, that's our protection as a society against an overbearing government. So the Constitution is a piece of paper, ultimately. And without the motivation to do something about it. So in your example, let's say that something that President Trump did was deemed by the judicial branch to be unconstitutional. And he said, bite me. What could transpire? What are the options? So that's a that's a great question. And this is one I've had debate with people about, even, you know, lawyers who think about this. And the president could say, listen, I think that's a fake judge. That's a biased judge. I don't need to listen to what that judge has to say. And then in, say it weren't the president, it was a private party. An example that comes to mind for me is a friend of mine whose next door neighbor agreed to pay to have an, a tree taken down that was partially on my friend's lawn and partially on the neighbor's lawn. It was very expensive. My neighbor paid the full bill. My friend paid the full bill and then asked the neighbor to pay his share, he said no. So my friend went to court, got an order from the judge saying, you need neighbor to pay for your half of taking the tree down. The neighbor said, no, just like Trump might say, no, I'm not going to adhere to this order and divulge my interest in Trump properties that receive support from foreign companies or countries, excuse me, allegedly. So. That neighbor said, no, I'm not going to pay attention to that order. And my friend then had to get the equivalent of the local sheriff to go to the neighbor's place of business, which happened to be a restaurant he owned, and open the till and take the money out. Now, at the federal level, that would be the marshal service, which the president controls. Oh, wait. So what you're saying is, in this case, let me kind of follow it along. The judicial branch says, you violated. President. The president says, bite me. The judicial branch then sends in the marshals whom the president controls. Correct. And and the president says, come on in and put me in handcuffs. And by the way, you're fired. Or what happens? I direct you to ignore the judge's order. Okay, so that happens. Then, then we have a constitutional crisis. That is, those individual U.S. marshals need to make a decision as to whom they are going to listen to. And there's a theoretical debate on a number of levels that plays into this scenario. One is when you're a federal employee or an officer, who do you actually serve? The law is not clear on this. Do you serve the president or do you serve the population? Ultimately, the other citizens of the United States do you serve the Constitution? Are you independently allowed to construe the Constitution? Or in that matter, who construes the Constitution? So many years ago, in a famous case called Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court said, the courts decide what the law is, and the courts can decide if another branch of government is violating the law. 
that's not in the Constitution itself. So the President Trump could say, I decide what the Constitution says because I'm the president and I read it this way in terms of the emoluments clause. It doesn't apply to uh, an owner of a hotel just taking receipts from patrons who happen to be from foreign nations. That's not a gift within the meaning of the Constitution. And if the Supreme Court says it is, I don't, I'm not bound by that because I'm the president and I get to decide what the, what the Constitution says. I mean, to a certain extent, isn't that at best just bucking convention? I mean, he's not, in that particular case, you can't say that that's breaking the law. Well, I mean, if it would be a big deal to ignore Marbury versus Madison. I mean, you know, that, you know, common law is more than convention. That is when the Supreme Court makes a decision that becomes the law and it's law in the same way that a statute is law or even the constitution is law. It can be overturned by statute. It can be unconstitutional and overturned by the constitution, but it's law. So I think that would be a major constitutional crisis to say, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I'm going to read the constitution my way. But we've seen this. I mean, we saw this with, with the question of, you know, what's the definition of torture and the Bush administration taking the position through John Yu, who's now a professor of law at Berkeley, who was then in the Justice Department, took the position that when it comes to commander in chief powers in a time of war, uh, the president has unfettered discretion. But Professor Yu has also come out and publicly critiqued the current president for overstepping what the limits are of executive authority. So really thoughtful scholars debate these questions and they're coming to a head in a, an extraordinary way. And my particular interest is just alerting non-lawyers, non-constitutional lawyers, constitutional scholars to these questions, which have for many, many years just been left to the ivory tower theorists, but they really have concrete implications. And of course, you know, the next two Supreme Court picks, if they go to Donald Trump, is going to have a tremendous influence on, on how this is assessed going forward as well. I have some questions about the Supreme Court picks, but I want to put a pin in that for a second, because I think a lot of listeners will be thinking, wow, this is really interesting. And now I'm just exhausted. I have decided that I'm on team Trump, or I'm on team GOP, or I'm on team Dem. And I don't really want to have to think about this kind of stuff because how does that really affect me? I like what he's doing with regard to backing out of the Paris Climate Agreement. I like what he's doing getting us out of these alliances. I don't really want to have to think about that when I vote or when I post on social media or when I tell people this is who I'm supporting. What concrete things should we do to improve our decision making process once we've chosen a team and kind of committed to that team vis-a-vis -vis these technical things that you're talking well, about? Well, I, I hear two questions, or at least I, I'm interested in responding in two different ways to your question. The first is, how do you respond to people who say I'm on Team Trump and I like what he's doing and my response to that is whatever new tools he's creating for himself in this position of president are then permanently in the presidential toolbox going forward. So, and this refers back to your, your question about conventions and motivation. We have a lot of, you know, values that we hold dear as Americans, you know, freedom, independence, ingenuity, respect, humility, honor. None of this is in the Constitution itself. None of it's spelled out. And so we do expect, I think historically, we've expected our elected leaders to act in a manner that's consistent with these soft values that undergird the Constitution. And when our preferred president, we like this president, if that president is start slashing and burning these things, that's arguably permanently then in the presidential toolbox. So then 
when the next person rolls around for our children or grandchildren that we don't like, they can act with indiscretion and not have any accountability, um, or at least not accountability in a manner that was consistent with how things were done prior to any particular president in this instance, President Trump. So turning over his tax returns, for example, refusing to do that, that's a convention. That's not in the Constitution. It's not in any law. But voters who support President Trump or citizens who support President Trump might want the next candidate for president if it happens to be a Democrat or someone they don't agree with on other issues being elected saying, well, this is now the new convention. I don't turn over my tax returns. That could be very, very problematic to that person down the line. Did you feel that way as Barack Obama was expanding his executive orders and then handing that baton to Trump? I mean, it was fine for a lot of people as as Barack Obama was using executive order because people were saying, yeah, but that's because he can't get anything passed any other way. But that does put certain things in his toolbox that then he passes to Trump. Well, and that's a great point. Uh, The irony of the executive order, I mean, that's a very, very complicated topic from a separation of power standpoint, in my view, because it sort of, it blasts a lot of conventions, which I could go on at some length. But there is a historically, the use of the executive order goes way, way, way back. So as a matter of of convention, it's real and it exists and it's conceived of as part of the president's article to take care power. And, but it's used sparingly. So to answer your question, yeah, Barack Obama's more aggressive use by some people's view of the executive order then I think makes it hard in the next presidency to critique President Trump's aggressive use of executive orders because it is in the presidential toolbox. And when I say it's a complicated topic, it's that there's a divide in constitutional and statutory law between judge-made law and other kinds of law, when I say primarily constitutional legislative law. So when you think about a, a, a law passed by a legislature, it's usually people sitting around and deciding we have a problem, we need to fix this problem, it affects a lot of people. So prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we have racism that's rampant in our country or a problem that we've decided that we wanna fix. Prior to that time, it was maybe a problem, but there just wasn't any law against it. Congress decides there's a law against this and it affects a lot of people in the future. That's generally, reserved for legislators, for for people who are elected by voters. And if you don't like the laws they're making, you throw them out. Judges do the very opposite. Judges look at past behavior involving individual people. So-and-so, you know, I went into Starbucks, they had water on the floor, I slipped and fell and broke my hip. So I'm gonna sue that particular Starbucks for negligence. It's a gripe between the individual plaintiff and that individual defendant about past behavior. So when people talk about activist judges, they're essentially saying, oh, judges are acting like legislatures. They're making rules for lots and lots of people. Well, the executive branch is kind of in between. It's not either a judge or it's not a legislator. It's technically executes the law. So the job is to enforce the law, kind of like a a police officer or a prosecutor. But with these executive orders, the president is technically, in my view, making laws just like Congress. So there could be there could be an argument that, listen, this is beyond the power of of the president under the Constitution. The problem with it is that historically it's been done. You know, there's been, I think, 13,000 of these since the dawning of the American Republic. So it's hard now to to kind of put the the shift to the gearbox in reverse and. It's an example, I think, of not just with Barack Obama, but historically with, okay, once it's in the toolbox, even if it's not in the Constitution, it's there to stay. So we need to be really careful about what we're tolerating with our elected leaders going forward in terms of preserving an accountable government for our children and our grandchildren. Well, what about looking at the Supreme Court in a very similar way, where a conservative Supreme Court justice is seen as not legislating as just 
acting on the original intent of the Constitution. And a liberal Supreme Court justice is seen as legislating. And that's kind of the divide. And then you think about back to our earlier conversation about the Fourth Amendment. I don't know that the Founding Fathers had any original intent about internet surveillance. So how do you even address that issue of original intent and whether we like this Supreme Court justice because they're conservative and this Supreme Court justice because they're liberal? I know that this is a big, a big question, but looking at executive orders being a form of legislation and looking at liberal judges being accused of legislating. How do we mush this into the conversation so we have a better handle on this? Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought this up because this distinction between originalists or strict constructionists of the Constitution and activist judges is really a false distinction. It's a, it's a smoke screen. It, there's nothing or very little there. There is something there, but, but not in the way that it's discussed publicly by pundits and in the mainstream media, et cetera. So the, the typical scenario goes like this. Conservatives, as you mentioned, are strict constructionists. They read the plain text of the constitution. They apply it. If there's, if it's not there, they move on. They're not creating laws. And so we should like them because they stay in their judicial sandbox and they don't try to do more than they're allowed to do. Whereas liberal, I think the, the story goes, liberal judges will say, well, we want to, we want to change the world. Therefore we're going to go beyond what Congress or the constitution says is our sandbox because we, we don't like this behavior and want to change it. The truth of the matter is the, the constitution is really old, right? 1789 and the amendments are 1791 and it was a different time and it's kind of sparse. So it has lots of ambiguity in it and there are limits to the extent to which the plain language is going to answer questions even back then, but certainly not modern day. So the originalists would say, well, I'm going to start with the plain language of, for example, the word search in the Fourth Amendment. Now, search in the Fourth Amendment, you think of red coats coming in your house, opening your drawers and rifling through your closets and taking stuff. Today, you think of search as we talked about earlier. It could be arguably that this isn't clear under the law yet. It could be taking a bunch of random bits of data applying an algorithm to it and finding out everything about what Becky's been doing the last week, who she's spoken to, what, what her doctors told her, what books she's reading to the point of even, you know, sort of discerning what your thoughts are. Uh, the framers might say that's a search. Now the originalist would say no plain language of searches rifling through drawers because that's what the constitution says. So in this instance, we're not going to hold that the Fourth Amendment applies. But we have Justice Scalia in a decision holding that um, that a heat sensor outside of a home was a search when it picked up marijuana growing inside. That's taking the metaphor of rifling through the underwear drawer a little too far to call yourself an originalist. Well, I mean, the problem <laughs> with originalist is when you have an ambiguous word, and you say, this is what it means, it, by definition, if it's ambiguous, there's some reason why you're choosing one, one definition over another. And if it's not in the, in the sort of constitution itself, then you're looking somewhere else. You're looking to conventions at, in, in 1791. You're looking to dictionary definitions in 1791. Why those are any better than contemporary ones, who knows? In addition, sometimes that wasn't even there. Some strict constructionists will just say, this is the obvious meaning. They might have a, a political agenda and they're not disclosing it because they're claiming that this is the plain meaning. So in your case with Scalia, how does he justify that infrared search for marijuana being the intent of the founding fathers falling under the rubric of unreasonable search. I mean, how does he justify that? Well, I think the justification from an originalist or in, in that instance would be what information is being gleaned from inside the house. And if the redcoats were to obtain the equivalent information in 1791 without a warrant, would that 
have constituted a search under the Fourth Amendment. And presumably, if you're getting stuff that's inside your house that isn't visible from the street, that you haven't put for public consumption in the town square, and the government gets it without a warrant, then that would have been a violation. I think that is how they would get around, uh, an originalist would get around that particular fact pattern. But this runs throughout the law. I mean, another example is what we know of as constitutional standing. That is, you have to have a broken arm to get into court. You've got to keep judges in their constitutional sandbox and not give judges the opportunity to legislate by giving them questions that are really more sort of for the generalized public and future behavior. But that has spawned this very complex multi-step test that gives judges lots and lots and lots of discretion to decide whether something, a a plaintiff has a a broken arm or not. And that whole architecture was, the modern architecture was largely devised or spawned by the originalist Justice Scalia. So, So there are lots of examples of alleged originalist thinking that has exploded into lots of cases that that have definitions and expansions on the plain language of the Constitution that aren't in the Constitution. So are they hiding behind this whole label of originalism? I know. I don't know if that's a motivation, but the flip side would be, you know, the alleged activist judges and the activist judges, what are known as functionalists, the opposite of the originalist, the living constitutionalists, right? The living constitution. They'd say, okay, let's look at the soft values underlying the constitution. We've talked about this already in this in this discussion. This notion of freedom, this notion of privacy, this notion of of autonomy. I mean, we can make long lists, we might disagree on, but there's some that are foundational. And they'll say, let's construe the concept of search in a way that's consistent with those soft motivations or values or conventions. And so the argument in favor, in my mind, of reading the Constitution that way is that that thinker will at least be putting their motivations on the table and saying, okay, these are my motivations and not hiding under the pretense that it's clear. And I say to my students, whatever your political affiliation is, a lot of these very, very controversial decisions from the Supreme Court are what we know as split decisions. Five Supreme Court justices will say the language means this. Four Supreme Court justices will say the very same language means that. So in my mind, that just by definition means there's an argument that it's ambiguous. Right, because they're not arguing what it should be. They're arguing what the language actually says. And if you're going to pick a side, I'd rather know why you picked your side. Right, instead of hiding behind... I I say this because that's what it means instead of discussing what value could be attached to that particular constitutional fact or whatever. Right. And I don't mean to suggest that there is no benefit to an originalist point of view, because I do believe that you start in analysis of the Constitution or statute or contract. I mean, it's what lawyers do with the plain language. And so I have a lot of respect for that line of thinking But what I take issue with is how in the general sort of mainstream media and when people talk about this, they're blurring the very nuanced truth about this and making it seem like, oh, liberal judges want to stretch the Constitution, conservative judges want to stay in the confines of the Constitution. And that's a false dichotomy. That's just not accurate. I wonder if the whole concept of being a conservative or being a liberal is really what people who claim to be one or the other understand. I mean, I've had so many friends say, I'm a conservative. And, you know, when you press them, I I, I want want someone who is going to appoint conservative Supreme Court justices. And, or conversely, I want someone who's going to appoint liberal Supreme Court justices. I just wonder how many people, and I'm sure some do, there's plenty of smart people out there, but I wonder how many really understand what that means in the way that you're talking about it. I find myself teaching second and third year law students every year, and they're all amazed by this discussion. It's a huge light bulb that goes on almost without fail. And they've already had a year or two of law school. So my guess is if 
those people find this enlightening non-lawyers, even highly educated non-lawyers, perhaps not with the exception of maybe political scientists, don't understand this. And a lot of what you read on the internet, op-eds, even from highly reputable newspapers, often get the nuance correct. It's in there. But if you don't understand the you know, the various layers of this, what's really amounts to complex theory, you can get easily misled into thinking it's a clear choice when it isn't. What do you think today would be the biggest shock for all the founding fathers? The biggest shock, I, I personally think this question around privacy and the level of access that government has into our individual lives and thought as a result of technology would be quite shocking and disturbing to the founding fathers. Um, I mean, I'm not a legal historian, but I, I, I've i read the most recent Fourth Amendment decisions by you know the Supreme Court, both, both the conservative, traditionally conservative and liberal justices. And I think the, the court itself is aware that this is a thicket. This is really a problem that needs to be solved. We have, you know, years of constitutional case law that construes the Fourth Amendment in a way that has a very clean line between the public and the private sector. And that's not working anymore in terms of enforcing these soft values, this notion of people just want to be the right to be let alone. They, they want to be able to draw boundaries from where the government and for what reason can have access to private information. I hope that we're not so exhausted that it doesn't matter anymore. I hope that this deluge of information still allows us to remain curious about what it means and also what we can do about it, because that seems so daunting. Sometimes, you know, you just think, okay, I, I, you know, I've thought about all this, uh, that, that for me, my answer is I'm going to pour a glass of wine, or in my case, tequila. <laughs> so at the end of each of the shows, we have something that I call quick curious questions or QCQs. And it's just a way for people to understand a little bit more about you, get to know you, and provide resources and things that people can take action on because one of the ideas is to curiously explore different topics, but then also have actionable bits that people can do once the podcast is over. So all of your resources that you've talked about and the ones that we're going to talk about will be in the show notes at appliedcuriositylab.com forward slash blog. The first QCQ that I want to ask you out of the grab bag is what is your favorite under $100 purchase that you've made recently? I would say a vintage David Bowie Changes One album for my children to listen to on an old-fashioned record player. That's been a very delightful addition to my life for eight euros in a Berlin street market. Do your kids value it sufficiently? I think I think they value it more than they vi value their downloads from Spotify. They're fascinated by holding the record, by putting the needle on the record, by the fact that if you turn it over, there are other songs on the other side that you have to hold it carefully. It, it's. I think it's a great example of how technology has just taken our lives by storm. Back to our other conversation, the law hasn't caught up with it. The law is way, way, way behind. I remember for myself when the first CD came out, that was an incredible innovation. And now that's, you know, like the Pony Express. I mean, that that's sort of old, old, old technology. But th this is very old. This this record is very old. It even is sort of torn on the cover. And I, I listen, listen to it incessantly when I was 14 years old in high school. So it's fascinating to see my children delight in the same music, the same songs, ground control to major Tom. They just love it. <laughs> ground control to major. I mean, I, okay. And first of all, that's love that one of my favorite albums. We're big vinyl. I should say my husband's a big vinyl fan. I was thinking about, as you were saying the CD, I was preparing a TED talk and going to the TED organization and going over the talk. And I was trying to talk about how a lack of curiosity can stifle innovation. And I was using the example of Sony and Philips. And I was talking about how Sony and Philips were battling it out in the Betamax VHS standards battle and Sony lost. 
And I'm telling this example, I think it's just a brilliant example of how a lack of curiosity or a fear of being wrong can be stifling to innovation. And I was saying that after that standards battle was lost by Sony, all the electronics companies were trying to rush to figure out what would be the digital format for audio. And Sony said, we're out. And Philips said, you know what, we're going to fly to Tokyo and meet with you just to see if we can hammer out the standards. And Sony had, I don't know if you remember those big discs, they were laser discs for audio and vision. They were the first like DVDs, but they were big, like bigger than a, a 33 record. And yes, they remember those. Okay. Yeah. So I'm telling the story and I, I'm looking around and everyone seems to be kind of my age ish. And I'm telling the story and I'm kind of surprised by their lack of enthusiasm for this story. And I said that, you know, there is this moment in time when Sony's just kind of looking like we're out. There's no way that anyone's going to buy 45 hours of music on one disc. And the Philips guys reach into their briefcase and pull out what we have come to know as a CD. And the Sony guys just like bash their foreheads and say the Japanese equivalent of, oh, because they never stopped to realize that although 45 minutes would not probably be a good product to try to sell, 45 hours, excuse me, of music on one disc, but what would it look like on a much smaller disc? Because they had been so afraid of getting things wrong, having lost the Betamax VCR battle. And I stand there and I'm so excited. And there's just like, their eyebrows were like flatlined, just completely flatlined. And I thought, and... One guy says, I think I've heard of Betamax, but I don't know what that is. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, maybe he doesn't look like he's my age. And he says, you can't tell that story to the audience because you're going to lose more than half the audience. And as you're telling the story of your daughters getting excited about turning the album over from one side to the other, the story is flashing back in my mind and how it's so hard to step back from what we know and try to unlearn what we already know. And then the other thing is, oh my God, I'm getting old. So those were the two, those are the two, (laughs) those are the two thoughts that kind of raced through my mind. What, um, what piece of advice would you give your 30 year old self? And I don't know what you were doing at 30. So that might be helpful as well. I mean, at 30, I think, I was at the Justice Department and I had my first child. And so I was in the throes of that stage of life. I I think professionally, I would have, and I tell, I'll just say what I tell my students, I would have specialized a lot earlier and gotten really, really curious and deep into one thing. I tended to be more of someone who likes a lot of balls in the air. Um, Personally, and this is maybe a topic for another podcast, I think I would just be better about taking care of myself. When I say taking care of myself, just listening to what mattered to me and coming out and making that a priority. And that has implications both professionally and personally. But as a parent, that's something that I care very deeply about conveying to my own children. And I don't mean to feed the narcissistic culture. I mean, really having an internal dialogue that that you can trust. And uh, today, I think it's very, very hard. It's harder than it probably was even when I was 30, because we live in an environment where our public persona is as important as our personal persona. When I say, you know, what, what goes on our Instagram and feeds and our Facebook and all of that has to be carefully curated. And it creates almost an illusion that of a person that may or may not be accurate. So I think that kind of grounding is something that I wish I had had more um, awareness of earlier on in my life. I think that's good. And it makes me think of the fact that so much of what we talked about today, I think people could think that's fascinating, or up to a point where it can just get mentally exhausting. And then they think, you know what, it just doesn't matter. But the balance of being curious enough to be informed, not necessarily just hand the baton to someone else that's going to define everything for you because you signed up to be on their team. So I'm going to watch this kind of news and they're going to inform me of everything. That balance where you want to take care of yourself, that kind of personal, I want to dance with my kids to David Bowie, 
and you're balancing that with all of this information and how much do we need to concern ourselves with, that's, I think, about the gap between what we want to know and what we know. That's the curiosity gap, right, that makes us click on what is my horcrux or what is my spirit animal, you know, that kind of thing. And then the gap between the more important gap, which I talk about in Applied Curiosity, which is the gap between what we want to know and what we need to know. And how much time do we spend paying attention to filling those two gaps? That's what I was thinking about as you were answering the whole idea of being present and and that. So it, it's just kind of an interesting thing to unpack in light of the heaviness of this particular topic. And, conversation. and the other thing I would add to that is what is knowledge? I mean, not to get philosophical, but this this whole war on facts, fake facts and fake news, I think that's extremely dangerous. And so as far as, you know, unpacking what the complexities of the Constitution, I mean, one basic takeaway that is, which is what I discuss with my students on the day after the election is to understand the difference between policy and politics. That is, politics is ideological, emotional, you know, it triggers different parts of the brain than this notion of policy being based on facts. Policy could be, what do we do about global warming? We'll, but we'll agree that there is global warming. Maybe we won't do anything about it. We can make different policy decisions but we'll at least agree on certain empirical information. And I think learning the distinction between those two things is really important and getting sort of pushing back on this notion, there's this postmodernist notion that there is no such thing as a fact. I think that's really, really absolutely crucial to have an educated, informed public that's going to essentially uphold and prop up our constitutional and democratic government in in the future is to say, okay, we can disagree on what to do about stuff, but we are going to agree that facts are facts. We we could say, listen, you know, President Trump is maybe some people believe he is violating the Constitution and say, we're not going to do anything about that. And then have a debate about the pros and cons of not doing anything about that in which we might discuss the implications for future administrations. But to just deny that facts exist, I think, is is really problematic and the and a related issue there is is with this complete onslaught of information that we have. I and mean, when I was growing up we had three TV stations and a few radio stations and a few major newspapers, you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, Washington Times. And there were conventions and there still still are that grew up within these arenas for ensuring that what goes in the newspaper is accurate. So no one goes to jail necessarily if something, they they miscite a source or they don't get two good sources for every fact that's stated. But there was a convention that propped up or upheld the news that then we all benefited from. And now, as we've seen you know, with the alleged Russian interference with the elections, I say alleged, but, you know, every national security agency has agreed that that happened. You know, other things we hear about in terms of information that's inaccurate on the internet or is actually planted in in order to affect behavior in ways that we're not aware of. We have to become very agile consumers of identifying facts from opinion. The whole notion of biased news versus fake news and conflating those two things is really, again, this is, you know, it's, it's why I say, you know, my own thing is we need to usher in the age of curiosity. You were talking about the difference between knowledge and I would say that the continuum is data. Data is B, 6, 0, tree, Q. Information is seeing that as a string of characters, right? That's a seeing those seeing that data as a string of characters. Knowledge is understanding that that string of characters is your Wi-Fi password. Wisdom is using it to log on to the internet. I always think about is that data? Is that information? Is that knowledge or is that wisdom? Just thinking about those four chunks helps you even determine whether something is biased news versus fake news. 
I think it's helpful, but I think we do need to be more vigilant and more curious. And, and you know, we're not, we're not taught critical thinking skills. We think, oh, our children should be taught critical thinking skills, but there's no curriculum in, in our standard education for understanding fallacy or cognitive bias or any of these kind of exhausting topics that I love to obsess about. Or even just to having tolerance for gray areas for something that doesn't have a clear answer and a quick answer. I've seen in the 10 years that I've been teaching students come to law school, very, very frustrated that there isn't an answer. And I say, you know, if someone could Google it, they wouldn't hire you and pay you a lot of money to, to resolve it for them. I mean, law is gray and, and the way we do it as lawyers and judges is identify, you know, certain facts and legal principles that we can all agree on that may or may not answer the direct problem, but at least we can agree on a set of principles. And then from there, we can argue, do we stretch it this way? Do we stretch it that way? But every lawyer and judge starts with excavating the basics. And it's that kind of approach to these constitutional issues, what's happening on the national level, it's about making good decisions, even in your own personal life. You kind of put the cards on the table. You agree what the cards are. Maybe something isn't quite a card, but you might consider it or might not. And then you derive conclusions from that. And it's that basic skill that I think is not political. It, it doesn't belong to one political party or another political party. I mean, we can argue as to whether one is utilizing it more than the other and we have different opinions on that. But my personal view as an educator and a citizen and a parent is that it's a fundamental skill we all should have so that collectively we can make better decisions. I love that. Tell everyone a little bit about your book when you think it's going to come out and then where can people get a hold of you? Oh, well, thanks for that. And I can fill in more information as I have it, but it will be something about demystifying the outsourced constitution, something along those lines. So it will include a lot of what we're talking about today. That is how to understand how the constitution actually functions. What are the levers of power and how are they supposed to work again across political parties so that the non-lawyer, the non-constitutional lawyer, the the lawyer who had constitutional law 25 years ago and didn't really have it in a way that sort of spelled it out in a practical manner can get a grip on how to have this conversation. So I'll talk about that. And then it will go into more detail on the fallacy that there is a private sector and government per se, that, that it kind of it challenges this notion that there is a government because there certainly isn't one as a practical matter when we see all the crossovers between the public and the private sector, and then says, well, what do we do about an environment where the Constitution doesn't apply? You know, we fall off a constitutional cliff when you've got the private sector engaged. So so it'll talk about that. So it'll be on Amazon. And when when is it coming out? It'll be at this point, I think the target date is April or May of 2018. Well, I'm sure we'll have you chatting with us on the podcast between now and then. And I so have loved our conversation. And I'm really glad that I've roped you in for round two in the very near future. Yes, it's been a delight. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Have a good evening. You too. Kim Whaley is a lawyer, author, media commentator, and constitution demystifier. She can be found at kimwhaley.com. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. Before you take off, I have a quick question and a few more things to let you know about. One, you can find show notes and all resources mentioned at appliedcuriositylab.com forward slash blog. And the question, would you enjoy joining the ranks of curiosity seekers and adventurous thinkers? If so, you are invited to join the tribe of the curious. You'll receive Quick Curiosity Monday. This short weekly email is curiosity lube for your brain. It consists of ideas I'm pondering, curiosities the tribe has shared, and things that I'm enjoying that I suspect you might too. Just go to appliedcuriositylab.com to join, or you can probably just pick your favorite search engine and type in Tribe of the Curious. And let's connect online at Becky Saltzman on Twitter and on Facebook at Applied Curiosity Lab.
Finally, in order to avoid missing insights from outside the boundaries of ordinary, subscribe to Apply Curiosity Lab Radio on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and all the other places podcasts hide and wait to be discovered. In the meantime, elevate curiosity.